quick medical evaluation of all personnel subjected to explosions is now required. The increased attention has led to a big increase in the number of diagnosed cases, from about 12,000 in 2005 to almost 29,000 in 2009. Mild, moderate, or severe, the symptoms of TBI can persist for years. The main obstacles that I had to overcome, which are pretty much consistent with every other TBI patient that I've met, are some serious attention deficits and memory problems, both short-term and long-term. No recollection of much, not able to do anything on my own, and very bad balance. And I also could not talk. And I had lost some vision a little bit. Uh, also from my memory, I couldn't rem really remember too much, but it had came back like I had lost my whole, pretty much my whole vocabulary. I couldn't speak, speak at all. You just have problems with people, you have problems with uh, how, you're, how you react to questions, how you talk to people. Uh, if I was talking on the phone and my wife said something to me, the, both conversations would just end. I wouldn't hear anything until I would like reset myself, probably the best way to put it. It's a horrible way to live if you can't remember what you got sent to the store for and you come back and they go, oh my God, what is this? I mean, you, you know, you, you're not 90 and you're not stupid. Because of the risks, pro football has developed a whole new set of rules and guidelines that restrict how soon a player can return to the field. So there's a sea of culture change. We've got to change the thinking of our athletes and our soldiers that it's okay to sit it out until they can recover. Similar changes are being promoted in the Army. Brigadier General Richard Thomas, the Army's Assistant Surgeon General, says one of the goals is to remove the stigma that often prevents soldiers from seeking treatment for unseen wounds, their inner enemy. This is going to be a process, uh, again. We're looking at affecting a cultural change, and that's a difficult, you know, at best, maneuver. I mean, you don't have any problem if you hurt your knee, you know, come seek medical care. But we want them to feel the same way if they, if they have a, a concussive injury or if they're showing signs and symptoms related to uh, post-traumatic stress. We certainly w we have good treatments available to them. That's my doctor rolling. Team River Runner is an all-volunteer organization with chapters across the country. They've got one goal, and that's provide wounded warriors the opportunity to go kayaking on a river. It's not part of an official treatment program, but for the active duty service members and veterans at this session, it's therapeutic. Brian Eisenhower, a former Air Force supply sergeant, was injured in a car crash while stationed in Italy. Chip Sells is a former executive officer for an Army forward surgical team in Iraq. They have in common their love of these kayaking excursions, as well as their traumatic brain injury. TBI patients sometimes say they feel like they're in a boat when they're on land. Since kayaks do have a tendency to roll, Brian says the experience has helped him with his balance. I spent most of probably a month and a half to three months upside down before I was able to maintain uprightness. One place DARPA went for expertise was DECA Research and Development in New Hampshire, a collection of 300 engineers, computer whizzes, toolmakers, skilled craftsmen. It's kind of a Willy Wonka chocolate factory for high technology. The load. A design team can generate plans for a never before seen device, then deliver the plans to the in-house shop, where slabs of aluminum or titanium or other metal can soon be turned into pieces of a prototype. DECA has developed all sorts of important medical technology, but they're best known to the general public as the creators of the Segway. Compensates the length and diameter. Dean Kamen is the founder, mastermind, and resident inventor behind the company. They had heard that I uh, collect quirky, smart, unusual people that look at the same problems everybody else looks at, but see them a little differently. DECA is spread across two buildings of an old textile mill. 
The DARPA director and some of his managers came to visit. I was waiting for the big pile of data, and the big pile of, you know, the, the, the ever famous government specifications for toilet seats. But he just sits there and says, I don't want a plastic hook, a plastic tube with a hook. He says, I came here because you're going to give me something to put on these kids so that they could sit at this conference table, reach out, and pick up a raisin or a grape off this table. And he pretty much told us that we were insane, uh, which, is, which is good, because that's what DARPA does. We, we have to try to push the uh, boundaries of what is thought to be doable and not doable. Kamen gathered a small team to travel around the country to research the feasibility of the new technology. And I said, I still think you're nuts, but not as nuts as I thought. And I think we could probably build an arm that is not as good as the original equipment, but way, way, way better than the garbage you're giving people now. Kamen estimated it would take about three to five years to have a prototype. DARPA told him he had two. It's not one of these things where the government said, OK, fine, here's the money, and we walk away and hope that they succeeded. No, no, we had a team of experts from the government representatives that met with them on a weekly basis, every single week. What are you doing? How far are you going? Push, push, push. And Dean Kamen and his team, to give them credit, they responded well. They pushed, push, push. And the fruits of that is here. So what we did is we traded money for time. And then, of course, the wrist rotates. In fact, the wrist rotates more than yours can. He can go from one extreme <laughs> more than I can. All right, now we'll spin back. It's got nearly all the movement I need, and of course I have all this flexibility with the uh, um, arm. There's really three basic problems you're trying to solve. One is providing the functionality that the arm has, and, but that only does you so much good. You've got the arm that can do stuff, but now you've got to do two things. One is you've got to attach it well to the people who are going to wear it, and second is you've got to control it. And they feed information to this computer, which is wireless, sending signals up to these computers, which are hardwired into six computers here on the hand. The control and, issue uh, is as complex as then, the arm itself. Uh, the DECA solution for now involves a series of gyroscopes and controls so, mounted on the feet. The arm is controlled by foot movement. I sent a signal to the computer that I'm in the arm mode, so by lifting my toes up, this goes up. I use my feet to control my hands, and I think in the brain that the feet and the hands must be pretty well connected together because what I do with my feet just seems easy, intuitive, that it starts making my hand work the way I would like for it to. This computer, of course, will be made into a microchip, as will the other computer. Both Fred and Chuck Hildreth have found the controls easy to master, but there are other control solutions. The DECA arm is really an advanced technological platform, but it's controlled using body motions, using a foot switch. So it is not exactly thinking about using your arm the way you and I would. You have to use surrogates. So you have to move your foot to make your hand open and close certain things. In the Windy City, where the professional football stadium is dedicated to the military, the world-renowned Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago is birthplace of a technique called targeted muscle reinnervation, or TMR. Because that's the rigidity of the base plastic. That's the brainchild of Dr. Todd Kuyken. He's using the nerves that once controlled a real arm to control a prosthetic. And even though the arm is lost, the nerves remain, okay? And they're like data channels. So what we are doing is taking the leftover nerves that used to go to an arm and moving them to different muscles. So for example, with the shoulder disarticulation, we would take those nerves and move them on to the chest muscles and let them grow into the chest muscles. Now when you think close hand, a little piece of your chest muscle contracts and we pick up the electrical signal. You think bend elbow, a different piece of muscle contracts. The first patient was Jesse Sullivan from Tennessee. Jesse lost both arms in an encounter with 7,200 volts of electricity. He became the recipient of the first bionic arm. He said you could go like that. This clip shows how his chest moves when he decides to open and close his hand one finger at a time. I don't like it. I wish I had my arms back, you know, but being as I have to wear prosthetics and given the opportunity to be a part of a project that's going to improve prosthetics from, now, from here on out for the future is it, what an honor it is. The first time I noticed that I was in the shower and I felt the warm water and I could feel the heat 
in my hand. And so I hurried up and I finished my shower and I called Dr. Peck and I was like, it's working, it's working, I feel my hand. Claudia Mitchell, a former Marine, lost her arm in a motorcycle accident. She's describing an unexpected benefit of the TMR program. The operation can restore more than just muscle control. So one of the surprises we had when we did, first did the surgery is that we can also get the hand sensation nerves to grow into other skin. So for example, we had a patient where we put the nerves onto his chest muscles. Now his hand sensation nerves have grown into his chest skin. So when you touch him on his chest, he feels his missing hand.